This lecture is on tibial plateau fractures. This is from the OTA core curriculum. Lecture series version 5 by Dr. John Wickstead. I'm Saka Purman narrating these for you. So here are the objectives, and we'll go through these in parts. This video will cover the first two, and then in the second video, we'll go through the second two. So let's start off with the first objective. Let's describe the initial evaluation and management of tibial plateau fractures. So um, these are one to two percent of all fractures you'll see, uh, very similar bimodal distribution to many other periarticular fractures where uh, we see these in young adult trauma patients uh, and then sometimes in older patients as well. So uh, here you can see um, two different varieties of these fractures and we'll go through a lot of these different presentations where you have sort of lower energy, mild, mildly uh, displaced uh, tibia plateau fracture on the left treated non-surgically, whereas you have this sort of higher energy fracture dislocation type injury here on the right. So age and mechanism will help to dictate injury pattern to a certain extent, uh, as do other things. Um, when you have somewhat older patients, middle-aged and elderly with simple falls, uh, you will see uh, split depressed patterns, sometimes just isolated medial side injuries. Higher energy uh, or sometimes sports related injuries, you'll see these split fractures and we'll get into that. Sometimes rim uh, avulsion type injuries with ligamentous injury to the knee and uh, you have to be careful to not miss instability. And then you have your high energy uh, motor vehicle accidents, falls from heights. These are things you'll see in the level one trauma centers, for example. Younger patients, a lot of these bicondylar patterns and uh, higher risk for uh, neurovascular and related complications and open fractures. So here are those two, uh, two types of injuries that you'll see. The mechanism matters, so it is important to try and make sure, like with all these injuries, you get a good history. Lower energy injuries are oftentimes um, simple ground level falls, maybe being hit from the side, maybe it's sport, a sports injury. Uh, these can be length stable injuries, although there may be instability on exam. And I'm going to go over this a few times because I think it's an important concept to understand. Um, so when you have an injury like like this over here, um, you'll notice that there is some depression here. Uh, that joint surface is sort of pushed down here by the femoral condyle. Uh, so you can imagine what happened at the time of injury was perhaps there was a significant valgus force. You know, the knee buckles way maybe in like this in valgus at the time of injury. Uh, and then you sort of have the femoral condyle sort of driven downward and creating maybe a depression or a split. There's also a split here. So um, with that, you could potentially reproduce instability on exam. And a lot of times when we think about instability, we're always thinking about you know, just the knee ligaments are damaged. And therefore, if you were to apply valgus stress to this knee, that if it's valgus unstable, that means there's an MCL injury. Whereas in fact, you know, your MCL may be intact and actually, when you have this injury, it, it somewhat hinges on this MCL. And instead, again, the instability is happening from the medial femoral condyle here, maybe falling into this space, uh, obliterating the joint space and actually sort of dropping. You know, you could have the femoral condyle basically down to here in an extreme pattern, right? So you apply a valgus stress to that patient, they're going to be valgus unstable, Okay, and that is because of bony injury, not necessarily uh, a medial collateral tear in this case. And we'll come back to this issue. Um, on the right, you see higher energy injury. This is a, a potential fracture dislocation type pattern. You can see this is length unstable. Um, there's a lot of mechanism, perhaps with axial loading, shearing. These patients are also at risk for compartment syndrome. So on your initial exam, you want to Check, look for swelling. You don't want to miss a compartment syndrome evolving. You obviously have to check pulses, perhaps ABIs. And like I mentioned, check for instability. Um, when you have a very, very grossly uh, comminuted fracture, um, you probably don't need to check for instability, really. 
it's just in those cases where it's questionable as to how unstable it truly is. Uh, you'll often have to spl uh, splint these patients. Knee immobilizers work great. Sometimes you have to add a posterior uh, splint for uh, some rotational control. Compartment checks, DVT prophylaxis, imaging will involve plain films and then typically a CT scan. Uh, although you sometimes have to consider MRI as well. And um, uh, if possible at your institution, if you really need an MRI, think about that before getting your X-Fix put on. Uh, make sure your X-Fix is MRI safe, for example. Let's talk about some of the injury patterns. So you can't talk about tibial plateau fractures without discussing Schatzker classification as shown here. Okay, and we'll uh, go uh, in clockwise order here, starting with the Schatzker 1s. This is a typical split. Schatzker 2 is a split depression. Okay, so you have the split here, and then you have this sort of depression here. Uh, type 3 is a pure depression, and you, in practice, generally don't see these a whole lot. Uh, and if you were to get uh, advanced imaging, you probably will see a split in almost every case. But um, for practical purposes, um, you do have cases where you really don't have much of an appreciable split. Um, and if it's there, it's non-displaced. And the, the major issue really is the depression. Uh, then you have uh, Schatzker fours, which are pure medial plateau fractures, although you can see they frequently extend over to the lateral side, and there's some other classifications that describe this a little bit better, like the Moore classification. The classic, uh, classic Schatzker 5 is a bicondylar fracture, as shown here, and then the Schatzker 6 is really the bicondylar fracture with metadiaphyseal comminution or dissociation. Okay? All right, so lateral plateau fractures. You notice that half the classification was just isolated to the lateral plateau. Uh, the type 1 injuries you see a little less commonly. These happen generally in patients who have really good bone, uh, so it resists that sort of depression phenomenon, and instead you just fail by getting a pure split. Um, type 2 fractures are pretty common. You'll see these with higher energy injuries, sometimes low energy injuries, and you have this split depression. Uh, the depression is, again, the... Art, this, the, the um, chondral uh, injury and subchondral bone sort of collapsing and getting pushed down into this depression, or I like to tell patients it's kind of like a pothole. Um, and in type threes, you more often see these in elderly patients where you sort of just get this failure of the uh, subchondral bone and uh, you don't typically get like a real appreciable split. Medial plateau fractures you sort of see in these two flavors. So you have lower energy elderly patients with a simple depression from a varus injury. You don't see these, or I certainly don't see these quite that commonly. Um, and then you have sort of these higher energy patient uh, injuries as seen on the right. Uh, frequently there's some shearing, there's a higher risk for vascular injury. Sometimes you will get this so-called fracture dislocation. And as I pointed out earlier, a lot of these fractures actually all the way uh, exit all the way lateral to the tibial spine. We'll see some examples of that. Uh, the bicondylar injuries are typically higher higher energy. Uh, there is a risk for compartment syndrome in those cases, um, and sometimes it can be open, and these are cases where you do have to worry more about your soft tissue envelope, especially if you're pursuing ORIF, which you do in most of these cases. Um, so, careful attention to the soft tissues, and oftentimes you'll see when we talk about management, it may be a staged management for these. The OTA classification is another way to look at this. So the proximal tibia is the tibia, so it's bone three. Proximal tibia is one, so these are all 31 injuries. And then because it's periarticular, uh, the A-types are um, extra-articular fractures, right? And then the B types are partial articular fractures. Um, so, uh, and then the C types are complete articular fractures, right? So it kind of follows the typical um, classification scheme for, for AO. You should know this, it's pretty uniform uh, across the board, uh, but you certainly can't get away with uh, communicating about tibial plateau fractures. And most 
circles without knowing Schatzker classification. Open injuries uh, can certainly happen around the knee, usually in the higher energy injuries and the bicondylar variants. Of course, treat for open fractures uh, with uh, immediate antibiotics um, and uh, debridement. And uh, oftentimes, uh, these may require um, osteosynthesis. So you sometimes have to think about coverage options in severe cases involving uh, plastic surgery, potentially. We saw this x-ray before, uh, and um, this is so-called fracture dislocation. So what's happening here is if you look at, uh, for example, you have the, the fibula here, you have the rim of the lateral plateau, and let's just say this is the articular surface or where the tibia articular surface should be, okay? So if that's where it should be, look where it actually is. It's actually here. So this belongs up here. So what is happening is, as you can see in this blue arrow, there is a force vector in this direction. And you can imagine at the time of impact, this may have been all the way down here. And you therefore have the femur sort of going with the tibia in this direction or dislocating, so to speak, from where it should be up here. Okay, so that is what we mean by a so-called fracture dislocation. And in the CT scan here, you can see, you know, what we can say is that the femur should be articulating back here. And instead, it's going this way with, with this fragment here. Okay? So it's a little bit of semantics, but it does make some sense. Um, you can imagine, for instance, that um, you could have... Uh, you know, a substantial um, displacement at the time of injury. And if you had um, lateral collateral ligament uh, injury, that could potentially, uh, or if you had this injury, you could potentially disrupt the lateral collateral ligament in cases like this, you could you can imagine, right? And sometimes you may see an avulsion fracture from that type of injury. So this kind of thing doesn't always fit Schatzker classification. As I mentioned earlier, there are other classifications like the Moore classification um, that describe this. And just be mindful of these. These are very short. They need to get out to length. They're very unstable. They oftentimes will require external fixation. And you've got to watch for potential for vascular injury and compartment syndrome. There are also these posterior shearing patterns. These are a little less common. Um, more often seen in the posterior medial fracture. So when you have a fracture like this, but they can be bicondylar. And um, in these cases, you have to watch that you don't have um, a grossly unstable posterior fracture fragments that frequently are difficult to treat from anterior or the more common anterior approaches. So it's important to identify these so you can understand how you're going to need to manage them surgically. Some have even proposed using more of a three-column concept of tibial plateau fractures to better uh, incorporate and um, specifically identify uh, injuries in the posterior column and uh, develop your treatment plan accordingly, as, as shown here. All right, so we're going to pause there, and then we'll pick up with the next two sections in the next video.